You're listening to Should You Read It? Should You Read It is a weekly podcast that looks at books that can help business owners. I provide critiques and recommendations so that you don't have to wade through everything out there and can get back to running your business. Additionally, with each weekly book, we'll look at how it relates to other books in its field and what ideas cross over along all the books that I've read. In episode six, we're going to talk about Great at Work by Morton Hansen. Great at Work is all about standing out in your occupation. It's about doing work that is significant. We all want to matter in what we do, and Greater Work is going to try and help us do work that matters. Today, I'm going to cite a lot of resources that go with this book. There's also a link to everything in the show notes, so make sure you go there and find the other books and articles I talk about. I will not mention each one as I go through because there's a lot this time. You'll also find a link in the show notes to the full written version of this podcast if you'd like to consume it that way. You can also support the show by purchasing the Amazon ebook version of this show for $2.99. There'll be a link in the show notes. You did not wake up this morning thinking that it's time to be mediocre at work. It's time to do something that doesn't matter. It's time to just phone it. Now, maybe the job you have is uninspiring and you feel stuck there, but no one aspires to mediocrity. We aspire to significance. That is one reason that people purchase crazy cars in midlife or that they search for significance in the arms of someone that's not their spouse. Daniel Pink says it well in When. Here's a quote from When by Daniel Pink. What the end of a decade does seem to trigger, for good or for ill, is a re-energized pursuit of significance. The search for significance, for work that matters, is what Great at Work by Morton Hansen is about. How we do work that stands out and brings us a sense of significance. Hansen found that there are seven things which you'll see in the following paragraph. You focus on creating value, not just reaching preset goals, targeting. You eschew mindless repetition in favor of better skills practicing quality learning. You seek roles that match your passion with a strong sense of purpose, inner motivation. You shrewdly deploy influence tactics to gain the support of others' advocacy. You cut back on wasteful team meetings and make sure that the ones you attend spark vigorous debate. That's rigorous teamwork. You carefully pick with cross-unit projects to get involved in and say no to less productive ones, disciplined collaboration. These are the seven things that they found are key in working smart, not hard. Working harder is putting more time in the chair. It's pulling all nighters to try and get ahead. When we know that more work shortchanges the quality of what we do. When Hansen surveyed the books already out there on this topic, he found a lot of books that already had opinions and beliefs, but were not backed by evidence-based research. Here's a quote from his book. For all that has been written about performance, no book, to my knowledge, has presented an evidence-based, comprehensive understanding of what enables individuals to perform at the highest levels at work. Great at work fills this gap. It gives you a simple and practical framework that you can use to work at your best. Given my recent read of High Performance Habits by Brendan Burchard, I'd actually have to disagree until I looked at the published dates. High Performance Habits came out in September 2017 and Great at Work in January 2018. Hansen did not conceive of this book and write it in a few months, so he couldn't have had knowledge of Burchard's attempt at the same ideas that was also backed by research. Hansen says that instead of working harder to be great at work, we should be working smarter. He says that his research backed this up. So before we get into the main content of the book, we should know what Hansen's definition of working smarter is. Here's a quote from the book. To work smart means to maximize the value of work by selecting a few activities and applying intense targeted effort. To me, this sounds a lot like the one thing. The one thing focuses directly on figuring out which domino is the lead domino, the one that will start the chain going so that you can watch it and have great impact on your business. Hansen breaks the book up into two main sections. First, he looks at the four practices that are needed to manage our personal work. Second, he looks at the three practices that are used when working with others. Let's dive into the first part, mastering your own work. Becoming a master is a topic close to my passion, and I even wrote a whole book on what it takes to be a master in your field. According to Hansen, there are four things that people who are great at work do to become masters. First, they do less than obsess. Second, they redesign their work. Third, they create learning loops. And fourth is passion and purpose, or what he calls P-squared. Let's dive into these four items. According to Hansen, the key to start is to pick the fewest high value items you can and then do them. You have to obsess over only doing these things. Here's a quote from Hansen. Picking a few priorities is only half the equation. The other half is the harsh requirement that you must obsess over your chosen areas of focus to excel. Now you see this in the one thing as well, and here's a quote from that. If disproportionate results come from one activity, then you must give that activity disproportionate time. Now, what Great at Work adds to the mix is the research that the one thing didn't have. And here's a quote from Great at Work. 
In our quantitative study of 5,000 people, we found that employees who choose a few key priorities and channeled tremendous effort into doing exceptional work in those areas greatly outperformed those who pursued a wider range of priorities. Ultimately, it's the same idea that was introduced by the one thing, but backed up by research. Since this was the angle that Hansen identified as a hole in the market, he's totally on point. The focus Hansen recommends is also very similar to the idea of deep work in the book called Deep Work by Cal Newport. So here's Cal Newport's definition. Deep work is professional activities performed in a state of distraction-free concentration that push your cognitive abilities to their limit. These efforts create new value, improve your skill, and are hard to replicate. What Hansen adds to Newport's idea is that there are a few times we should not be worrying about focus. Specifically, he calls out two. The first time it's okay not to worry about focus is when you're generating ideas. The goal then is to cast around and find ideas that matter, so focusing on a single item will not accomplish that goal. It's okay to have distractions of others around that are tied to that same goal. The second time you shouldn't focus is when you're not sure which option is the best one. Say you've got two different marketing ideas for your business, you don't only pursue one. Pursue both with some effort and test them so you can decide which one is the one that needs your focus. That may mean you try building YouTube videos and writing blog posts. Then after a few months, you look and see which one is bringing in the most paying clients and move forward and you only execute on the single idea that's bringing results. Some of you are going to be wondering how you do this in the midst of your job where your boss wants you to focus on 99 things because this air quotes multitasking is a thing that you have to do. Years ago at my first web development job, every time the boss came up to ask me, the junior person, to do random tasks they thought about in the moment, I countered by showing them my task list for the day or for the week. On that list were the things we had decided were important. I asked them which item didn't need to get done on this list so the item that they just thought of could get done. My boss never picked the item on my list to not do. He always decided that his in-the-moment thought was of little enough value that it should not be done. It was not worth pushing anything else off my list. This happened because I forced priority on my boss, so you need to do this if your boss keeps scattering your efforts around. Our second practice is redesign your work so you're focusing on the right stuff. Where the last practice was telling us that we need to focus, this one is supposed to help us decide what we should be focusing on to get the most leverage in our work. Without identifying what is most important, you'll have to substitute more work for effective work. The fact is that more work doesn't add more value. In fact, over a certain point, it means you're doing crappier work. Here's a quote from Hansen. If you work between 30 and 50 hours a week, adding more hours on the job lifts your performance. But once you're working between 50 and 65 hours per week, the benefit of adding additional hours drops off. And if you're working 65 hours or more, overall performance declines as you pile on the hours. I actually see this again in a great article from The Guardian, and that article cites 39 hours a week as like the upper limit maximum. Here's a quote from that article. Long hours, stress, and physical inactivity are bad for your well-being, yet we're working harder than ever. Isn't it time we fought back? I say yes. In the more of less, it's acknowledged that we, while we may have seasons where extra work hours happen, unfortunately, all too often we let this become the norm. Here's a quote from the more of less. Certainly there are seasons in life that require focus, time, and commitment, and we would never discourage working hard on things that matter. Unfortunately, however, most of us have become busy over all the wrong things. We have allowed false assumptions to drive our schedules. So if you're going to redesign your work, what do you focus on? Do you focus on getting more work done? No way. You focus on creating more value in your work for you and your customers. Just doing more work, more hours is shuffling deck chairs on a sinking ship. That means contrary to many books on creating a life you want, Hansen doesn't actually start with your goals. Here's a quote from Hansen. The advice start with goals when planning an effort is wrong. We need to start with value and then proceed to goals. Ask yourself, what benefits do your various work activities produce, really? I ask myself this about these long book reviews. What value does it provide for my customers? As I was working through this over the course of a few weeks, I had no less than 10 people tell me that they read the reviews when they were looking for a book on a topic. I even had one person email me with an interesting book because they felt that I'd dig deeper than they would and they'd love to hear what I had to say about it. So I determined to double down on the reviews and add a podcast to them, which you're listening to. And they'll be ending up on Amazon as books to purchase. These reviews started as a way to make sure that I took good notes and that I focused on the content of the books. And now they're turning into something of a business. Now, Hansen doesn't leave us with a vague statement of produce more value. He gives us five ways that we can produce value. First is less fluff. Eliminate or reduce existing activities of little value. Second is more right stuff. Spend more time on existing activities of high value. Third is more gee whiz. Create new activities of high value. Fourth is five-star rating. 
find new ways to improve the quality of your chosen activities. And the fifth is faster, cheaper. Find new ways to do your chosen activities more efficiently. Adding podcasts, I'm trying to tackle two, three, and four. I'm digging deeper with my reviews going forward, and I'm going backwards digging deeper into older reviews. I'm doing more right stuff by adding the podcast and publishing the work online as books as well. We're going to see the same idea in an upcoming review of the 10x marketing formula, where they tell you to stop creating content that is merely interesting for your audience and only create content where you can have a strong call to action to something that you sell. Do more right stuff and stop just chasing traffic. If you're struggling to find out what creates the most value in your marketplace, then Hanson provides you with a few questions. Here's a quote from the book. What pain points can you spot in your workplace? What do people complain about again and again and again? What gets people confused and frustrated and saying, this sucks? Where does work tend to get bogged down? Now, I wrote a while ago that solving hard problems is the key to getting paid well. If you're not solving major pain points for your clients, then it's no wonder that you're getting paid poorly. In High Performance Habits, Brandon Bouchard echoes this as well. Here's a quote from that. Effectiveness in life does not come from focusing on what is automatic, easy, or natural for us. Rather, it is the result of how we consciously strive to meet life's harder challenges, grow beyond our comforts, and deliberately work to overcome our biases and preferences so that we may understand, love, serve, and lead others. Now, there's a trap to be had here as well. It's in the traction you get. It's easy to read these types of books and figure that after a week, you should be getting traction because you're doing something that's of value. This doesn't happen, people. You have to stick with it and test things and refine them until you're seeing some traction. Jumping around between what you think creates value is a surefire way to kill all that momentum. Here's a quote from Great at Work. You can't jump from one big redesign to another. Once you've made a major change, you have to stick with it and refine it little by little over time. Changing focus will burn your team out as well. You'll just get the ball rolling and then change things on them. That means your team will never fully commit to any idea because they just figure you're going to change it. Now we're going to dig into Hanson's learning loop. We've all heard about the 10,000 hour rule. The idea that it takes roughly 10,000 hours to become a master at anything. That it's only partly true though, because it's not just 10,000 random hours doing something, it's deliberate practice that matters. Here's a quote from Hansen. The secret isn't repetition. The idea that it takes 10,000 hours of practice to master a skill is misleading. One year of practice repeated in the same way for 10 years doesn't make perfect. Rather, a certain kind of practice makes perfect. Random practice is going to have you going a mile wide and an inch deep, never building your specialty. You must test outcomes and make changes so that you can get closer to the outcomes you want to see. Here's a quote from Hansen. Individuals who progress the most meticulously assess outcomes, elicit feedback based on known standards of excellence, and strive to correct tiny flaws that the feedback hasn't covered. This purposeful and informed way of practicing explains why some learn at a much faster rate than others. It also means that you must build a habit of coaching your team if you want them to excel. If you're looking for a framework for this, then the coaching habit has a really good one to get you started. Hansen also concurs with the coaching habit in that a yearly review is a waste of time. You need to be doing much more than that. Here's a quote from Hansen. Deliberate practice requires that a manager or employee receives helpful feedback every day, yet most people only receive it during their annual review. Imagine tennis great Roger Federer getting feedback on a serve only once a year from his coach. Yeah, I know people, that sounds laughable. Of course you wouldn't expect that, but that's what we do with our teams. As a manager, is a coach for their team. As a manager, what you are doing is supposed to be ensuring that your team excels and they're properly equipped to excel. Hanson provides us with a framework that he calls a learning loop, which has six tactics to learn effectively. Looping tactic one is carving out the 15. You must carve out 15 minutes each day to enter the learning loop. This is not something you can leave for a quarterly review and planning session. Improving your processes and work is a daily activity. You must focus on one key skill and one key skill only so that the one skill brings the most value to your work. Looping tactic two is chunk it. This is breaking up your tasks into small behaviors that you can affect. Something like turning off social media so that you can focus. The chunk is creating the space by turning off distractions so that you can focus on that single task. Looping tactic three is measure the soft. If your goal is to listen to your team more, you can't really measure listening, but you can measure the little behavior of having lunch with them. If you measure lunches with staff and then try to work on listening, it's likely you're going to be improving. Go into the lunch with a mindset of, I'm going to ask more questions and talk less. For a long time, I had a post-it note on my monitor that said, ask more questions, talk less, as a reminder for me. Looping tactic four is get nimble feedback fast. 
Here's a quote from the book. Useful feedback, however, requires more than simple rating. It includes information about how well a person did and suggestions for how to modify behaviors. This may seem like a scary part for both managers and employees. Here you're going to be asking your team to evaluate you. Set up some type of evaluation system where they can give feedback anonymously and make it clear that you want to improve, so you need feedback to ensure that you can be better at leading them. Another way to do this is to hire a coach to give you feedback. They're outside the organization and can help you dig into the behaviors that might be killing your intended change. Looping tactic five is dig the dip. When we may wish that everything goes perfectly for us, that we never see setbacks, this is not going to be the case. You need to dig into the dip because you'll hit it if you're going to tackle very hard problems. Here's a quote from the book. Variation, trying new ideas, is essential to learning, and tackling difficult problems can provide rich learning opportunities. People who pursue the learning loop typically see their performance dip over the short term as they introduce challenges and experiment with ways to solve them, but they realize gains over time. The challenge then is to learn to tolerate failure in the short term. The key here is to do a small experiment so that you can test to see what the outcomes may be. Don't just jump off a cliff. Looping tactic six is confront the stall point. Here's a quote from the book. As people develop expertise and skill in an activity, they can become very good, even excellent, but then something happens. They plateau. At some point, you're going to stop improving like a rocket ship. You'll need to stop and try new things, and it's going to be hard because you'll wonder why your old tactics aren't working anymore. This is often our zone of excellence, which we read about in a book called The Big Leap, and it's easy to stay here. You make good money in your zone of excellence, but you're still shortchanging yourself. You need to change that coach or test something new and keep pushing instead of becoming complacent if you want to be the best you can. That brings us to P squared, or passion and purpose. Here's a quote from Hansen to start this section. Motivational speakers, self-help gurus, successful entrepreneurs, human resource executives, and branding experts have all talked up passion. So much that you might believe that loving what you do is the only requirement to perform your best. The problem with all the people telling us about follow your passion is that we're suffering from selection bias here. There's a definition to that in the show notes, or a link to that definition in the show notes. The only people that have a platform we listen to did this. They followed their passion. We never see the 10,000 other people that tried to follow their passion and never got the traction of this guru that we suddenly listen to. Instead of just going with follow your passion, this mantra that's out there, Hansen tells us that we need to combine passion with purpose. Here's a quote from Hansen. Some people pursue passion in navigating their careers, but they also manage to connect this passion with a clear sense of purpose on the job. They contribute, serve others, make a difference. They have matched passion with purpose. That means they don't plot along with a job that they hate, they look at how they can provide value and, and that they, how they can connect in this job. They do this in any job. It can be done in any job. There's always a part of your work that matters and provides value to people you care about. Here's a quote from Hansen. If people have found passion and purpose in nearly every corner of the economy, then chances are you can find it in your job too. You don't have to quit your job or leave your company in a risky quest to search for the passion and purpose. Hansen spends some time here because his research found that out of the seven factors the book talks about, P squared was the second highest in predicting the high performance at work. If you love what you do and you connect it to a purpose, something you value, you'll simply do better work. Here's a quote from Hansen. If you love what you do, you show up with a certain amount of vigor. And if you also feel that you're helping other people, that they need you and depend on your contributions, your motivation to excel becomes that much greater. Hansen finishes up this chapter by introducing us to his purpose pyramid, which has three levels. First is create value. Second is craft personal meaning, and third is seek social mission. We start by creating value, doing no harm. Then, with that in our toolkit, we start crafting a personal mission and tweaking our work so that it fits within that mission. Finally, we look outside ourselves and at the social good we can do. If you're not working up this pyramid, Hansen contends that you will feel empty in your work. Here's a quote from Hansen. Many people experience a sense of emptiness because their job doesn't seem to serve a clear social purpose. But as the pyramid suggests, Purpose at work isn't about reaching the top level of contributing to society. It also includes adding value and finding personal meaning. If you lack a clear social mission at work, you can still discover purpose in your job by looking further down the pyramid. Try to craft activities that add more value and also carry personal meaning. Now that's going to bring us to the end of the first section, mastering our personal work. And it's going to move us into the second section, how we master working with others. Now, even if you sit at home and have no direct connections in your job, you have to work with others. You'll be working with people at church or some other volunteer organization. You've got friends and family that you have to interact with and work with. We all work with others, and thus, we all need to look at these three practices that help us do great work with others. First, you must become a forceful champion. Here's a quote from Hansen. 
The ability to advocate for one's goals and gain that required support is only one of a broader set of people interaction skills required in modern workplaces. We all have things we care about, things that matter to us and we think matter to the organizations we work with, things that will bring value. The hard part is that it's often very difficult to bring other people on board. We figure that we can just appeal and convince them with rational arguments, but we can't. Here's a quote from Hansen. Many of us believe that we need to appeal to people's rational minds to gain their support for our projects and goals. Just explain the merits of the case using logic and data, and of course other pieces will rise up in support. So we present rational arguments and lengthy emails and PowerPoint presentations in an effort to convince. And we can't snare people's attention with one email, well, we just send another one. And another one. If they don't get it, we hammer our argument even harder. We fall once again into the do more paradigm of work. Drowning people in all too familiar avalanche of emails, text, slides, and reports and data. Chip and Dan Heath wrote a whole book around this topic called Switch. Hansen and Heaths agree that we need to deal with the emotions of the people we're trying to influence. In fact, appealing to emotions was one of the main things that Hansen found that Forceful Champions did. The second thing that Forceful Champions did was to use grit to face the obstacles they encountered in the work around them. If you're looking to dig into more how to work around obstacles, then you should read The Obstacles the Way by Ryan Holiday. Unfortunately, there's also a caution here when it comes to gender and how men and women approach the same problem. Here's a quote from Hansen. So when a boss evaluates a man who uses forceful champion tactics, the boss may think, wow, smart guy. When a competent woman does the same, he may think, really aggressive woman, and downgrade his perception of her performance. Our finding in part may be shaped by such a gender stereotype. People regard female forceful champions as performing more poorly than their male counterparts, when in reality, they're not. Now, that means that women that were forceful champions are behind the men but they still ranked as higher than other women that were not forceful champions in their organization. We still got that gap to men, though. Hansen doesn't really offer us a solution to this problem, and I haven't read about one either. I hope this changes, and really, if you can keep this notion in your mind that you're likely to downgrade a woman who's being a forceful champion and upgrade a man who's being one, you're more likely to check this false belief in the people that you manage. The second practice in working with others was fighting and uniting. Hansen opens up this practice with the story of the Bay of Pigs disaster. In short, no one told the truth about their misgivings about the plan, so it went ahead. Many people were killed and captured as a result. Many people endured long times in jail and terrible treatment, all because some people at the top didn't voice their issues with the plan. Here's a quote from Hansen. The Bay of Pigs disaster stands as a monument to a horrible team decision-making process. As a leader of the group, President Kennedy failed to foster a rigorous debate. The individual participants failed too in their responsibilities to voice dissent and articulate the downsides of the proposed plan. The best and brightest failed. Out of this, we need to make sure that we foster dissent. If there is no dissent in the natural flow of conversation, then we need to get people to take the other side of an argument so that we can have some dissent. Now, that doesn't mean we have endless meetings about everything. In fact, that only shows you aren't good at making decisions. Here's a quote from Hansen. We don't need teams to conduct a vast number of meetings to get their work done. Rather, we need smarter teams where people debate rigorously and then commit to decision. What we need is that strong debate, and then you don't leave the meeting without a decision. Once the decision is made, you stick with it. Everyone is on the same page. Again, here's a quote from the book. In teams that unite, team members commit to the decision taken, even if they disagree, and all work hard to implement the decision without second-guessing or undermining it. This should seem obvious to parents as well. You stick together and back each other up. And not backing each other up means that the kids are going to play parents off each other and that's only a recipe for disaster. In your team, if you have a single person that just won't come on board, you need to deal with it. You don't let that person disrupt the whole team. They're only killing their productivity and they're harming the whole business. They're reducing the value that can happen in the organization. Bite the bullet, fire them, the team's going to be way better off. So our final practice that Hanson identifies as being important for being great at work is collaboration. Now, he start, really starts off with those two sins of effective collaboration. Sin one is under collaboration. That is when you never collaborate with people. You spend eight hours going in the wrong direction when a two-minute conversation could have stopped this error. This can be especially easy on remote teams where your head's down working on your own thing being productive. Sin number two is over collaboration. That's collaborating too much. Just because some collaboration is good doesn't mean that more is better. Hansen found that if you had deep experience in a field, then it was often a waste of time to do more than sound check with others. Put your head down and do your work. Now we have another gender-based difference here. It seems that women are way better at collaboration than men. Here's a quote from Hansen. Interestingly, women benefited twice as much as men from disciplined collaboration. 
Why might women benefit so much from collaboration? Our data revealed that a higher proportion of women were good at building trust, ensuring that parties were motivated, and crafting a common goal. More women were also better at seeking information outside their core team. That means women build trust better, and thus their collaboration yields better results. Yet, another argument for diverse teams. Hansen provides us with a formula to use when you're trying to evaluate if collaboration is useful. And it is, collaboration premium equals benefit of initiative minus opportunity costs minus collaboration costs. So let's go over that again. Collaboration premium, so the end result, the benefit of the initiative, how much benefit we'll get for the organization, minus opportunity costs, what are we giving up and what risks are we taking, minus collaboration costs. How many people have to work on this to make it work? That means if the collaboration formula yields negative benefit, we say no. It doesn't matter if you like someone or if you look up to them. You say no and get back to your work. That ends our seven practices and brings us to Hansen's final section, which is about bringing some balance to this work focus by asking us to focus on life as well. We'll start this section with a quote from Great at Work. Many of the top performers we interviewed, the ones who embraced the practices outlined in this book, realized benefits that extended well beyond their work performance. They were less stressed out, more balanced, and more satisfied with their job. Hansen found that if you want to be awesome all around, then seven practices are key, but they can actually have a bad side effect. They cause us to overvalue work and undervalue home. We make all the sacrifice at home and never get to be the parents and spouses we want to be. Here's a quote from Hansen. Top performance in any field seems to demand personal sacrifice. We presume that rising to the top requires crazy hard work, fortitude, endless practice, long hours, that it entails doing without vacations, neglecting your kids or your spouse, and spending weekends and holidays glued to your computer screen. Because we think this way, we tend to let our job responsibilities balloon out of control. Then, to achieve some semblance of a personal life, we go back in and erect a protective shield around our lives to prevent work from crushing them. We switch off the smartphone at home, or refrain from checking email when watching our kids' baseball games, or leave work early on certain days, all to prevent work from burying our private lives. Such measures only serve to treat the symptom, the result of working too much, and not the root cause, the work itself. But we tell ourselves this lie, Instead, we should be looking at working hard at the office and then coming home. The One Thing has a great idea here of counterbalance. In fact, I think that The One Thing addresses this topic much better than Hansen does. In The One Thing, they figure that you can ignore email for a week, but home for a day or two. You go out of balance long at work and short at home, because the consequences of going long at home are broken relationships and kids that hate you. There is likely little to no consequence for ignoring little things at work for extended periods of time, so just ignore them. That means you need to temper your seven practices with a solid look at how you're doing at home with those you love. It's not a success to have lots of money and a sea of broken relationships. Now, as always, our final question is, should you read Great at Work? I've already said that there's a decent amount of overlap between the one thing, high performance habits, and Great at Work. They're all looking at the same problem from different angles. Great at Work and high performance habits add research to the ideas in the one thing. Now, the one thing actually has a stronger framework to use to figure out what that single thing is that you should be working on. If you're mainly working on a team, then great at work is a better place to start. Then read the one thing and finish with high performance habits. If you're mostly working alone, read high performance habits, then the one thing, and then finish with great at work. But yeah, you should read great at work. You can find the links to everything in the show notes at the end, to all the books and all the things I cited. If you'd like to support the show, you can purchase the book on Amazon or purchase the review copy on Amazon as well. Thanks for listening to Should You Read It. To support the show, you can leave me a review in iTunes or Heart or a Star, whatever podcast player you use. These help more people find the show. If you want to get more reading done, you should also look at an Audible membership. If you get one using curtismckale.ca slash recommends slash audible, that will support the production of the show financially. In our next episode, we're going to look at personal Kanban. If you've ever felt overwhelmed by the tasks you have in your task manager, this may be the system for you. 